one man who doesn't really, really need much introduction uh, is Skrillex. Jeff Rosenthal is the um, one of the uh, the main guys behind the Summit series, which is um, an event not dissimilar to ourselves that, that endeavors to connect and inspire multidisciplinarian innovators. That's how they want it to be described anyway. So please welcome Skrillex and Jeff Rosenthal. Yes, perfect. <laughs> What's up, dude? What's up? You know, hey guys, can we just before we start give a round of applause to Ben and the whole crew putting this together? And you guys are awesome. Pete and Sam, you guys are amazing. What's up, Sonny? What's going on? Dude, hanging out at IMS, bro. This is uh, Jeff, everybody, if you don't know. Yeah. Um, so I thought it'd be fun just to start by hearing you know, where you're from like where you're coming from and what you're up to now. Just like catch us up. Man. Yeah, well, um, to make a long story short, um, so I've been making music since I was super young and been around music a long time. From the age like four to, to like nine or eight, I thought I was Michael Jackson. So I would dress up like Michael Jackson, sing and dance like Michael Jackson, break, break dance, whatever. Yeah. And then from there I started to play guitar and get into rock music. And I got a guitar when I was nine years old and that kind of changed my life. And I think it was that point when I felt like music, for me, was more than, a, than, a, than something to enjoy. It was a cultural connection. And then from there, I got into like punk rock and industrial and electronic music. And then by the age of 16, uh, growing up in LA, I left home and just started playing in a band full time. And then ever since then, I've just been making music. And um, yeah, it was, it was probably from the age 16 to, to 18, where I just kind of toured and was kind of finding myself and, and traveling a lot. And then after I left that band, I went back to LA and then just dove into the computer and I realized I can, you know, the internet was blowing up and the fact that you can release music so quickly at your own will at any time was just really exciting and inspiring for me. Which kind of um, leads into, I think, what we're sitting at is this kind of crazy, I would even say renaissance of, of how artists are using technology and how they're making art as well. Um, even past music, even going past music with, you know, they're painters and artists that have like Tumblr followers of like a million and they sell their stuff through Tumblr, they promote it through Tumblr and they don't use galleries to, to sell art, you know, which changes the whole art world and how that's working too. So it's just, yeah. Dope. That's the... That's awesome. Man. That's me. Um, I, I assume most of you guys have no idea who I am, so I'll catch you guys up a little bit on Summit and who we are. Um, about five years ago, myself and my co-founders, um, we're all young entrepreneurs, and we all had our own ventures and they were successful, but as many of you guys know, when you're young and you're starting out, you learn mostly through screwing shit up. Uh, so we thought it'd be really cool to meet other young people doing interesting things. So we, we threw our first event five years ago, gathered 19 people, um, just through cold calls and Facebook messages, also using technology in a way that you never could um, previously. And I think that um, the modern age is one where intellectualism or creativity or entrepreneurship are very diverse and multidisciplinary and aren't only owned by the affluent, but are owned by everyone. Right. Um, so it was always like mashup culture. And our events scaled exponentially and we charted over ocean liners and we took over towns and um, we very quietly been building uh, this thing around the world. And uh, this week, we actually close on Powder Mountain in Utah. It's the largest ski area in America. Um, we're buying it and we're building a center for innovation in the world. So we're developing our own small town on top of that mountain yeah. um, for our community. So awesome. Yeah. You should explain too, like what you've done with community and how you started too, like being in college and just being interested in like what different people were doing, entrepreneurs and people that were just notable and that were doing cool stuff. Because I, because how, how we started, how I started with Skrillex after being in the bands, like I was saying before and there, <clears throat> growing up uh, on indie labels in 2004, between 2004 and 2007, it was such a different industry. The framework was, was all majors and indie labels. And to make that next step, from being an indie band, you needed major label money and you needed like people to plug you into radio and you needed big budgets, right? And now since the internet has come out and it's become more than just like something, something secondary, it's been everything for Skrillex. And, and same with our record label, like how we, how we disseminate our music. But what that came out of was just community and just friends getting together and having fun. And it started out as 50 people and then 100 people 
but we kept the same gears and we yeah. just accentuated on what we already had. And I think it's cool that everything you've done is self-made as well. And you started out in college. Yeah, totally. I mean, like it's it's uh, interesting that every single industry, like every space, is ready to be blown up. It's not just music that's having revolutionary change at the hands of technology. It's really everything. And um, one of the you know, things I'm most thankful for for what I get to do is we travel around the world and just meet innovators and creators in every single space. And um, one of the things that I find repeatedly, and in your crew, it's one of the things I think is most fascinating, um, is that you'll find like families that end up creating this stuff and end up stepping outside of the normal model. Um, and, and your crew has been together for what, like 10 years? Yeah. Like you and your core, your manager, and your... Coming and your, on 10 years. Yep. Yeah. Um, so I, I think that you know, one of the things that we were talking about before coming out here is just like um, blowing up the existing model and trying to step outside of, of the ways in which it was done before. And um, you know, I, you, you guys, you own your own rights, correct? And you manage yeah. your own. Yeah. Well, basically, how it works is it's kind of a, this is kind of a crazy long story too, but I'll make it short. Like um, when I was in a band, when I was in from first to last, my old band, we had signed a big record deal with Capitol Records after we did two on on Epitaph. And then after that, that's when Capital and EMI and Virgin were like splitting and joining. And so, you know, no records, there's no funds. We had a producer lined up and nothing was happening. So at that point, I left the band. And from there, obviously kept my same team. And then with Skrillex, before Skrillex happened, I was signed to Atlantic to do some solo music. And because of some politics and some other internal stuff changing within Atlantic, that kind of never saw the light of day. So on the side, I was doing Skrillex. And there was, no really, there was no way to put this out through Atlantic at this time. So we just did everything ourselves. And that came with the touring, the art. And then from there, we restructured the deal for, for Skrillex, um, which, is, which is different than what I had before. But Ausla, my record label, and everything we do outside of that is 100% our own. But I still own my rights, like my publishing and all this sort of stuff. But what yeah. do you see? I mean, like, I, I, for us, we own our own company. And yeah. um, the way that we financed our mountain project was through um, all of our friends. We essentially have investors that are more in the structure of profits, profits interest than actual equity right. in our venture. And so it's allowed us to really be like servant leaders to the community that we, that we build for. Right. Um, how, has that, how has that affected you? I mean, I'm sure you have a bunch of friends that are still in traditional label deals, but like, do you feel like it, it impacts what you can create and your pace at, and that kind of stuff? Yeah, at the end of the day, you, 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 when you grow, you're gonna need more people, more bodies to do stuff. So it's all about making true partnerships and not feeling like, and I, and I think the, the less you can take out of something, and the more you can do yourself, then, then it's more equal interest, you know? So you're not like taking essentially big bank loans within, you know? So if you're betting on yourself and you can sustain everything, maybe it takes a little longer. Like it's been nine years for, to get to where I am now with the same team, with the same manager. And so that's how we just did it. It was like, we, you know, there was no rush ever to get giant checks or anything. So we just kind of sat back and, and take, take as much as we need to take you know, every step of the way kind of, kind of idea. So. And, and who are you creating for now? Because I know like community is really what we're all about and we've talked about this in the past yeah. and I know how passionate you are about it. Well, the, well, the, next, the next step for, for me that I've been taking is like what I realized, you know, over the last two years, I, I hadn't lived anywhere. I just lived in hotels from the, from the year 2011 to 12, to 12, to the end of 12 and to 13. So I just got my own place where I put a studio in, and then I recently purchased a building in Chinatown where I'm, I'm building uh, studios um, for in-the-box producers. When I say in-the-box, I mean producers that use computers. Um, and and there hasn't, there's nothing like that in Hollywood, I don't think, right now. And I kind of wanted to, to stay away from Hollywood just because there's already so much out here, and it's so competitive and noisy and crazy, and it's cool. but. Um, you know, I guess my scene and the energy and the core of where I came from came from downtown LA and throwing warehouse parties and being in inspiring spaces that, that sort of gush potential more than something that was already done. You know, like I said before, like, I, I like, I'm, a, I'm really close in attention to detail and everything from if someone walks in the studio, I want them to feel like they're in the place where they belong. So that's the current project right now is, is building this, this building is about 11,000 square feet and we're, building great facilities, uh, you know, with, with um, 
everything you need as a, as a computer producer to come in. So you're not resting your laptop on a big SSL desk and feel like I'm not using all these channels. So, so that's, like, that's, that's the next project. And just because there's nothing in LA like that for our generation, and it's going to be more than just music. There's going to be artists. We have our own team and our own label is going to be in there uh, building um, uh, our, our, an actual physical place for infrastructure. Because like, up until uh, a couple months ago, my team was all over the world and everything was by email. And, and I think people tend to forget when everyone's in the same room doing stuff together, stuff goes 50 times faster, ideas come pouring out and you get a lot more done. So building a home for our culture and our scene and a place to even document it to show people what it is. Because it's more than just, than, than I, I even think than what, than what most media thinks of electronic music, there's so much more that goes behind why it's there and why it came out of nowhere. And the people that are, that are doing it that are making an impact. So yeah. yeah, that's important to me. For sure. I think when you look at like hip hop and the culture, um, you hear a lot of like, I'm the best. You know, like right. that's a big competition it seems like. Right. It's like, I'm number one, that's what's up. And um, one of the things that, that you'll hear like Bill Clinton talk about, and you'll hear some thought leaders of our time talk about is positive interdependence and building um, positive interdependence and communitarianism as a concept. Um, and one of the things that's most inspiring about your crew and like, the, and, like Potato, like you, Diplo, A-Track, um, coming together, creating together, and recognizing that like best practices in each of your independent businesses can be learned from one another and everybody can win essentially. For so sure. instead of being in this attitude of um, uh, like scarcity, you guys seem to have an attitude of abundance. I think, I think just in any movement, like if people have the same goals and the same ideas generally, power in numbers is everything, like for better or for worse. Like whether it's the EDM movement or Nazis or whatever, like if you get a group of people together that all believe in the same thing, working hard at it, then stuff can happen. So for me it was how, how do I take, I mean, if I'm where I am right now, how do I further influence everything that's coming after me that's gonna ultimately help me and ultimately help everyone and it's fun. Like, I did this because I liked getting together with like-minded people. I like the fact that we share music, we share ideas, we shared everything. That was so different from the scene I was before, which is why I wanted to kind of get out of it. It was just so, it was, such, it was becoming such a business and when that happens, you as an artist become diluted and you start thinking about pleasing different people and maybe for people that are more mature and older, it's easy to, to avoid that being in, those sort of situations, but for young kids, man, I was, I was so young too, I was like, you know, 16 touring and everything, and it, it, you can be sensitive to that, and then you can forget how to create art in a way, because it becomes a business, and it's not coming from you. So I just wanted to build a place where younger artists who are essentially, they're, you know, especially when you see kids that are coming out 12, 13, that have access to the same tools we have, making stuff that's just mind-blowing, you want to keep that. You want to keep their souls pure because that's what that's what that's what's going to make them grow into something bigger. If you dilute them and give them crazy ideas and give them that pressure, it can fuck with their head, screw yeah. with their heads. So you say fuck with their heads. Fuck we're, with their heads. Suck it. Yeah. Yeah. So I mean, and I just see so many. Art, but now kids are getting smarter and smarter, and teams are getting younger and younger, and and it's pretty exciting. So I just I want to give a place for people that can can still be independent and do what they do, but more, more or less the vibe in an environment, you know? Like, the first step of throwing a rave is location. You know what I mean? You want, it, you want it to feel good, and then you put the music there, and then you put it there. But as long as you walk in and you become inspired by the space, and everyone around you is like in it for the same reason, that's cool too. It's dope. Well, I'm all over you right now because I have 100 questions. Yeah, I mean, me to... yeah, absolutely. Well, I was yeah. going to say, like, talk about how you first got it started, like, because this is a cool story. How you guys all maxed out your credit cards and. And yeah. did your first event. And so yeah, so um, we were all young entrepreneurs. Um, Brett Levy, who's my co-founder, is here. Uh, he and I threw parties together in Washington, D.C. He was at George Washington, and I was an American. And uh, we just had a bunch of hustles, right? Like clothing companies, um, jewelry companies, websites, what have you. And um, we found some success in our early ventures and really just needed to meet other people that were doing interesting shit. That was it. It was like, we wanted to meet cool people that did really great work. And if you guys, most networking events are terrible. Um, most like industry gatherings aren't that cool. Obviously IMS is the bomb, so you know, this is excluded. Um, uh, and, and we were just like, well, let's throw our own thing. So we maxed out our credit cards and we, and we hosted, um, you know, the first event we hosted, our founder Elliot Bisno put together, and it was 19 people. Um, 
in a ski trip in Park City and you know, lost like 25 grand. And the second event we did was six months later and we had 60 attendees. But from the very beginning, the caliber of our people was like through the roof because it was authentic. Like we had reached out to people we looked up to um, and it was the guys from College Humor or Blake from Tom's Shoes. Um, the second event had Dustin, one of the founders of Facebook and Tony Shea from Zappos and Scott Harrison who founded Charity Water. And I don't know if you guys know who any of these people are, but they're all profoundly inspirational people. And at like 23 or 24, meeting these folks who we were like, oh my God, like look at this world that's out there. And it honestly shifted our priorities because we like, you know, came out of school thinking that it's like build a business, make a bunch of money, uh, like, like, like sleep with hotter girls. Like that's what your society essentially teaches you is your value system. Then we met these people that were like, no man, I'm gonna change the world. I'm gonna inspire a generation to go bigger and think bigger. And like, you know, that for us, we got bit by that and it was over. So, um, you know, those first two events we lost a bunch of money on and just, you know, like, like Sunny was saying. And within a year we were working with the White House and Bill Clinton and the United Nations and um, our events scaled to 270 attendees and 750. And as I said, we then were chartering boats and all sorts of crazy stuff. So um, literally from like zero, from nothing, yeah. um, just the tiniest little idea, we're now gonna be building essentially the modern day Aspen. Yeah, so cool. Yeah, it's, it's similar stuff too. Like the idea of just investing your resources into something you really believe in and then when you have the right teamwork behind you and the people that really believe in your art. Yeah. It was only a couple years ago, like before, let's say, skip back to three years ago, like I'm, I'm in debt, I'm probably in like, f fuck, like 30, 50 grand. Three years ago. Yeah, three years ago. It's so like, like a thousand 50, days. Yeah, it's that, a thousand okay. days ago. Yes. A few moons. I was, I was like, you know, debt, like I was living off credit card, like I had, I'd spent some, I got this lease on this building that I was actually essentially trying to do the same thing I'm doing now, but this is three years ago and it was so whack and like not, not, not legit, but I built out 10,000 square feet of, of uh, studio space as well. And this is me and my friends living in this warehouse that wasn't zoned for living. So a year later we got kicked out. I was in so much debt. Skrillex started to go and I was just paying off my debts and trying to like re, like stabilize myself, I guess. And I remember at one point I had a million dollars in my, in my account and that was it. And we were doing this tour and th all the shows were selling out. Um, it was my first nationwide tour and I spent all that money on production. Like, it's like, okay, cool. I just want to make these shows really, really special and I, I want to make a show that everyone re remembers and I want to show that, show people that may not necessarily know where we come from that it's more than just meets the eye, it's more than just pressing a button, like there's so much that goes into to creating a great show. So I spent all my money on that, didn't have anything past that point, didn't really know what I was going to be doing or what, what the thing was, but like, it's times like that where you, where you really truly believe in something and you make that giant leap, and those are, all, those are all, all, always really surreal and important times in your life, kind of like opening a new chapter, like you're moving to a, a different city, or you're, in, or you're going 100% on a new idea. It's, those are always important, I think, as artists and creative people to take those, especially when you have the right people around you. So, yeah, that's really cool. I mean, well, dude, I, like, I think we both viscerally remember what it was like to have nothing yeah, and totally. be at zero. Um, and one of the things I think is so cool about uh, being an artist at your scale is that you have a real platform to see the world from. Like literally at times you're in front of a crowd of 100,000 right. people. So you have an understanding of, of uh, a generation that's coming up right now who I hope will like eat our lunch. Like I right. pray that somebody will do way bigger, iller, more right. amazing shit than us. Um, but will I'm curious. Too. Yeah. So like wh what do you see right now from where you're standing? Like wh where are things going? You know, I, ju I just think, I mean, it's, if you're talking about the music industry and the fact that it's like losing a lot of money just because of the infrastructure and what it needs to, 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 to you know, pay for all this stuff. Like, I, I don't, I don't, my crew and, and the people on my label and speaking for us, we don't really need that, necessarily need all those things. So I think all it is is going to be a continuation of, and a realization of how you combine new technology with ideas and just doing it yourself. And I think that's going to change a lot. And, I, and, I, and people are still going to do their things and the major labels, have a place and everyone has a place, but I feel like m more so for people making music themselves, a lot of these kids are their own artists, they're their own, they mix their own records, they make their own records, they find the people to collaborate with them and their manager helps facilitate all that. It's kind of like, you know, so it, I think, I think, I think it's time to, this is going to sound cheesy, time to let the artists speak, but like, you know, like watch what they're doing because there's kids out there that are just, 
doing creative things, and I think good art, if it has a platform, I think good art will, will be seen now because... And, and what yeah. about, like, like my, I love your music. My dad hates your music. <laughs> Generally, people over the age of, like, 60 yeah. for sure don't get, like, you know, elect, like, right. like either electro or dubstep or whatever. Um, but, but I find that there's, like, so much aggression and so much heart and right. love in the sound. So I'm, I, and I appreciate the music industry component yeah. of this, but where do you see, like, what's going on just with the generation of kids? That, like, even, even Coachella this year, like we were talking earlier, it's like eight years younger average age probably than it was last year, you know? That's awesome. I think that's really cool because those are the moments when you, between, like, being super young, like 12 and, like, 20-something, those are, like, the records. When you fall in love with records at that age, those records stay with you forever. And... Like when music matters. Yeah, and, and, and I think, yeah, I think that's when it really matters. And I think the music will grow. I mean, the, the aggression and all that stuff, that's just me. Like, I made all those records on the road, and that was what I was going through, and that's just what came out. Like, I don't think, you know what I mean? I don't think about what makes me inspired. I just create what makes me feel good, and then it comes out. So, like, that's just who I am. It's, I guess it's a gateway into how my mind works. Maybe it's not, you know, maybe some people think I'm crazy because of that, but that's fine. Like, that's what I like to do. And I also, I mean... I've always gravitated towards people that weren't afraid to, to be expressive and be loud because it's, because it's easy to, to be quiet. And I think what my music ultimately says is like, hey, you can be loud and you can, you can, be, you can be bright and you can do all that stuff. And, and yeah, I don't know. I just, uh, what was the question again? I don't know, but that's a great answer. <laughs> yeah. It's all good. Yeah, so back to, to grandmas hate my music. I think there'd be a problem if they like my music. Um, and I should start getting, thinking about how to become edgier, I don't know. Um, yeah, man, um, I don't know. Do you guys have any questions? Please, I'm better when people ask me questions. I'm not used to saying. Just shout them out. Hey, I'm uh, Kun Shah from Lift for Live Music. Um, every time I see a uh, question mark on a uh, lineup, I automatically assume it's uh, Skrillex that's gonna be showing up, like holy <laughs> shit, and uh, different festivals. Is that something that's done because of like a monetary reason, or is it like something that like festivals you want to play but they don't have the budget to book? Like, are you talking about what festival? Like, like what festivals holy I'm not shit, doing? Um, like there, other well, holy, sh yeah, holy ship was something. Like, I, I wasn't I wasn't booked to do or planning on doing, and I just wanted to go, but I didn't want to make a big deal about it. That's well, like. why. Um, yeah, exactly. Yeah, <laughs> so like, definitely was not a money thing, but it was a lot of fun to do. Like, and that's a big that's a big part of it. Like, I wasn't. I wasn't promoted on the lineup and it was a last minute thing and they had a lot of, the thing about Holy Ship and the way Gary Richards does all of his events is it's very kind of family spontaneous so there's gonna be someone there anyway. So like, there's a, you know, there's a few, I mean the thing about that, that festival as well is like everyone's playing sets together, everyone's joining each other so yeah, I decided to play some records. Hey, uh, Mitchell Kalman here from Chicago. Uh, I just was wondering how difficult it is to manage a label while, or build a recording studio while also managing your own career and being on top. So much work. It's 24-7, it's, it's it really is, man. And that's what's great about having a good team, though, because, like, you know, it's a lot of work. But I, I love it, man, because, like, in, I want to look back at, I mean, there's, there's like I said, this, especially this uh, building project, man, there's nothing like this right now. And I think having a place where people can feel they can be themselves and do what they need to do is just essential right now. So I want to look back and, and see that, you know, so it's, it's good, it's rewarding. Everything is work, like, there's always going to be work in, in this stuff, but it, if it's not, then you don't really get to the next level, so. Some of, some of our maxims are, it, it's all work and it's all play. Um, and if you live in the frame of an artist, essentially, like you do and like your crew does, it's all a component of the same thing. Yeah. So it's all fun. It's all fun. It's, yeah. it's doing, it's a lot of doing this when I say work. It's not like, I want to create a, a fairy tale world where you can be expressive and people can look the way they want to look and people can make the music and I want to build a place where you're not going to be criticized for being yourself. And, 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 and music and fine art are totally two different things. You know, music is like a visceral feeling where you have fun and you enjoy yourself. It's not meant at least the type of music I do. It's not meant to be picked apart at and, and to be criticized because where this whole thing comes from is, is really this independent fire that people have in, them, in themselves to just do something and work hard. I and mean, all these people, Diplo, A-Track, and the list goes on of people that own their own record labels work so hard yeah. and I see it because I'm traveling with them. We're on our computers all the time 
like, what, I mean, what I would say from being around you guys is that yeah. um, it's all a body of work. It's not like your music is your art and right. your record label and this building is your business. It's right. all a component of the same thing. It's all thing. the same thing. And like, yeah, I mean, I don't, I don't feel any different. Like, as far as me and as far as my goals and as far as like the person I am, like, I don't feel any different other than I, other than, other than just being more excited about the next level always, you know? Like, that's the, that's the thing to think about as well, like what your real goals are. And my goals, I mean, I left the band and after we had this big deal and I didn't think I was gonna see money again or have money again, um, but I never really cared about that. I just wanted to feel happy and not feel like there's people around you all the time that, you know, influence you in, in negative ways, that's all. You know? Totally. Yeah. All right, so last time we saw was about three years ago in Atlanta, you, you were playing one of my shows. And to, Where is this at? Which Atlanta. Show? Quad. Masquerade? Oh, quad. quad yeah. Yeah. That. Okay. So, um, so <laughs> basically what we're doing right now is we're using social media uh, trends and data from artists, from all artists' social media platforms to predict, um, to predict how well they're going to do and get brand information. I wanted to ask you how you think social media affected your rise to fame. And I wanted to give you these cheap headphones, a uh, promotional gag. Oh, mm -hmm. nice. Gag it out. Dope. Um, <laughs> yeah, so wait, well, sorry. So the question again, one more time, it was... Social media and how yeah, it affected you. Yeah, it was huge. I mean, all it was essentially was it, was, it was social media. MySpace came out and was a very simple way to communicate to people. And then obviously that snowballed into Facebook and all this stuff. And now Twitter was like a really simple way in 50 characters or less or whatever it is, just to, to be social and to be real. And I think that's a big part of it. When social media, like there's some companies that you can hire to get your likes up and get your followers up. And, but I feel like a lot of that can create noise. And what creates social media is when you actually feel like you're social and being yourself. And I think that's a strong part of why it works is because it's kind of like, you know, a lot of these people on Twitter have big followers, like I follow, I don't even know what they necessarily do, like some actors or even some musicians that I don't even listen to, but they're so clever on Twitter. It just, it yeah. makes me like them more and enjoy them more. So I think that's a big part of what that was. Other than that, like, like the Bangerang uh, record that I put out last year, like we didn't do any advertisements. We didn't know, like a lot of people don't know this. A lot of people think there was this giant machine behind it cranking, but we did no radio campaigns. We did no advertisements. I didn't spend any money on banner ads or print or anything. It 100% came from my Facebook. And then the blog started to pick it up and then it just took off from there, which is pretty exciting and pretty cool. Mm -hmm. um, so it's, it's, it's everything, essentially, social media. As soon as it becomes too advertisement as, as soon as a platform changes too much, then someone else is going to do something and that's going to come up, and that's sort of the, the trends that have been happening that I've been seeing. When you put out the first Skrillex album for free online, yeah. was that within the bounds of your record deal? No, that was all all, all of us. Yeah, that was just us. So, but I mean, was me. it like legal technically though, from the perspective I mean, of that? You know what? It was like I said, it was this cr transition time where I was at Atlantic, where we weren't really working together, but we weren't like fighting each other. But yeah. it was just like they didn't. Like, they weren't prepared for what Skrillex was, or I don't think they understood what it was, so I just did it myself, and I think technically they, we could have gotten the legal stuff, but they're not mean people, like, yeah. essentially, like, they would have to be pretty... But yeah, the, yeah. the reason I asked that is yeah. just to illustrate a point, like, PayPal um, was yes. started by a bunch of entrepreneurs, like, Snyder's entrepreneurs, who actually are, turned out to be some of the most brilliant people alive, like, yeah. Elon Musk from Tesla and SpaceX, and Peter Thiel, and Ken Howery and that crew, yeah. but it was illegal. It wasn't a legal business. Like, that's why MasterCard didn't Dodge do it. You. That's why Bank of America didn't do it. And um, I like it. Is it still illegal? I mean, no, now it's legal, okay, now it's okay. fine. And they, they put together legislation for how you exchange money online and all that kind yeah. of stuff. But like, in this new, like, pioneering world, sometimes you have to bend the rules a little bit, or just take a risk, or just, you know, go right. for it. And with what you guys did by putting your music out yeah. for free through social, just said, fuck it, and went for it. Yeah, I mean, it was, it was cool. It was, it, the cool thing about that was, it was like, I mean, my, I probably had like a thousand followers on Twitter, and my fa it wasn't like my Facebook or anything was rocking, but like, we put this link up, and the hype machine was just starting to really blow up. I don't know if you know about this blog. It's a blog generator. So like, you go to hypem.com and you type in an artist you like, and then it pulls up all the blogs that are talking about this artist and posting the song. So like, essentially, you know what they? I guess what the 
the blogs are doing are illegal when they're posting downloads, but I've always been cool with that. Like anytime I have a release, I want all the blogs to post on my stuff and I want people to download that stuff because there's a certain group and people that are downloading the stuff, they don't buy records anyway, you know what I mean? But it's a place where they all go and there's other people that do buy records and I'm not necessarily like trying to, to fight the way nature is kind of going. I'd rather just accentuate and see how we can all win on it. Um, but that was the first step of like, whatever, put it out for free, give it to all the blogs, check it out. And I, and I did it with so much music, you know, and it's just been awesome because these people that are, that are, that are generating these blogs are, are real passionate music lovers. And, and I think kids can feel that energy. You know, that's why like, you know, what was your name, by the way? Ism. Ism? Yeah. So you blog roll and check all that stuff out all the time, right? No? Yeah, it's a big part of it. Same with SoundCloud right now, man. SoundCloud is amazing. It's incredible. It's like, it's so convenient and easy to use. Yeah. And it's for musicians and for music lovers, made by music lovers, made by musicians. And that's why it's like the framework and the energy behind it has made it that big because it's real. You know? Yeah, exponential creativity is definitely a byproduct of uh, the technological world we live in now. Uh, yeah. John Shu is our homie uh, who did like, G.I. Joe recently, he did all the Step, Step Up to the Streets movies, wow. and he had the League of Extraordinary Dancers. And that all started because he was looking on YouTube and he'd see a dance crew post a video, and he'd see a dance crew in Japan post a video, and then in Norway, like as a combat to that original one, and then a 12-year-old in Taipei take all four and do some more shit that none of them even thought of. So like that type of uh, exponential rate of creativity and development that's happening in business, that's happening in music, that's happening in art, it's happening across the board. Yeah. And before, like I was saying, like being in a band, like you just, man, if, if you didn't have any sort of radio push, you couldn't sell a lot of records. Like it's, it would be so few and far between those records that without radio would sell a ton of records. And like even the, the songs on, on, on my releases that became really popular aren't pop songs. They're not verse, chorus, verse, chorus, bridge, outro pop songs. Like they're strange songs. And that's the, that's the cool thing about this too is it, it changes what the standard of mainstream is because my music is not mainstream music or wasn't mainstream music. I made it in my bedroom when I was playing it in front of smaller rooms than this like for a very, very long time. And now that it's become a, very popular, now other people can experiment with even song structures and what it means, what a song even means because there's just an idea of what a song meant and there was so much pressure to have like three minute songs all the time and like it, and it limits you when you're being creative. So that's the other cool thing too is like, now there's more artists that you see th that have just, that can, that can make music outside of the framework of a pop song because you can go on YouTube and, and as much as people say that attention spans are smaller, I think they're greater. I just think there's so much more out there to become involved with. I mean, that, you know, that, that speaks for itself too anyway. I don't know what I'm saying. Sometimes I verbal, verbally <laughs> just go. Better at making music than talking. Yeah. Hi. Um, Sonny, this question is for you. It, there seems to be a bit of a kickback reaction among an older generation of DJs and artists saying, you know, for example, Richie Houghton did the control tour at various colleges saying that, you know, younger audiences needed to be educated on subtler shades of EDM. And, you know, there's the Yuma tent at Coachella this year for yeah. sort of like old school DJing. Yeah. And so, as someone, as the artist who's arguably the figurehead of, you know, the bombastic EDM youth right. culture movement. Yeah. What's your take on that criticism and do you think that young artists need to be you know, educated in that way? I think, I think there's so much criticism that's great because it's like people love it and then people hate it. And like if you walk in an art gallery and you stare at a painting and it makes you feel nothing and you just forget about it, like if, even if you hate it, like, man, I don't get that. Like, oh, like at least it's making you feel something. So I think that's, that's good, and that's a good sign for something that is becoming concrete. Um, I think a lot of it is, comes with, a lot of it is internet hype, and something that's negative can seem a lot louder than, than positivity. You know, like, you read through comments, and every 10 will be, like, something very, you know, whatever, something really negative. And then a lot of times, you most of the times, if you click on this profile or this Facebook of some kid that's hating, it's like a 12-year-old kid, like, just talking crap. Like, it's, it makes it seem a lot, I think, I, I think the point you're getting at is, like, you have this new bombastic, like, loud punk rock energy, whatever you want to call it, that's coming in electronic dance music. Then you have the old school, like, the techno, which was, which is a, 
it comes from a different place and a different energy, even though we're making, all making electronic music. But all I see is, is it just kind of coming together. And like you said, there wasn't a Yuma tent last year, and now there is the Yuma tent at Coachella, which does focus on more of the underground music. So it just shows that things are becoming more diverse, I think. Yeah, I don't know. Dope. What about what you do? Like, I have a question. So as, as far as like when you started getting into to what you're doing, the, bringing different entrepreneurs and bright people that you, that you thought should get together. Like, was there anything like that happening back then? Or were people doing it, but you didn't think we're doing it right? Or like, what made you feel like, man, I need to bring, we need to bring more people together with great ideas. Yeah. At first it was just for us. Like, we just didn't have a peer group. Um, and I'm certain that there were people doing it, but I don't think the authenticity was there. Um, and I don't think that the, um, in, like, the reasons people were doing it might not have been right, you know? Like, um, anybody that knows us knows that we deliver on everything we say that we're going to do. Um, like, we try very hard not to disappoint people. Um, and we're doing it because we like to connect and inspire the thought yeah. leaders of our time. Like, when we see you guys go and do incredible shit that otherwise wouldn't happen, it makes us feel really good. Like, it extends our impact. And, um, like, you know, the concept being, like, Tesla and Mark Twain used to hang out. Mark right. Twain would go over to Tesla's lab and, like, throw electricity with the dude or whatever. Um, and that's a really inspiring thought, you know? And, and I think that we do sharpen each other's, like, swords. So, yeah. uh, it might have existed, but we didn't know about it. And uh, with the exponential growth that we saw and the response that we got from our generation's top entrepreneurs that we were right. reaching out to, um, obviously there wasn't anything that was resonating with them right. yet. Otherwise, that's where I'd be right now. And the same goes for um, the community that we're building out in Utah. Like, dude, if there was a place that I could go where I knew I could have conversations with people that would change me and I could be open and authentic and not have to put on a front at all, I would be there tomorrow, you know? But since that place doesn't necessarily exist, um, that's what we're creating now. Right. So this guy, they literally have this mountain in Utah, which is like this utopia of, like a place where people can go literally hang out and meet and, and, and think of great ideas. And I'm sure so many great things have happened, like just when you get different artists together, just like now, you know? So many cool things happen when you get creative people together. And everyone starts from zero, like, Everyone at some point is just a guy or a person, but if you enable, if you give the gift and enable someone to help out and to be a part of something, I think that's, that's amazing, like in, enablers, like that's a true leader is when you can enable someone that's under you and give them a step. Because then you look around, man, there's a lot more geniuses than, you, than, than meets the eye, and you're like, man, these kids and all these people around me, all my friends that have been touring with me, just like before we were driving vans and trailers together, like getting $50 a show, like, making no money, but doing it all ourselves. And we were just kids doing that. And looking back at it now, like had we had the internet and all these things we have now, yeah. back then, it would have been a different story. But now that's true, you know? Now it's like, it's incredible. Leaders, leaders don't have followers. Leaders create other leaders. All right, that's good. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Well said, Jeff. Not mine. Somebody else said it. Yo, you had a question first, I think. I had a few things, but yeah. I had a question. And uh, uh, I didn't mean to cut what? you off. Depends what the request is. I can't take off my clothes on TV. Well, <laughs> just kidding. Sonny's not going to make out with you, bro. <laughs> um, I guess I'll start with the question, so, you know, I don't have too much people's time. It's the same question I asked. Um, as, uh, um, as an artist myself, um, and as someone that um, um, struggles between the love of creation and sharing that creation, wanting to get out to people, and finding legitimacy and success as an artist, um, and being in a sea of saturation, that, that, that sometimes can be a little bit difficult. Um, what advice would you give to emerging artists on how to present themselves? And this might sound really general, but like if it's not working in one place, go to the other place and make it work in, in another place. And it might take longer and it might, you know what I mean? Like if you're, if you're making music or you're being, you want to be a DJ and stuff, is that, is, I hate to, yeah. Well, that kind of leads to my request. Um, yeah. I've been producing for a few years now. Yeah. Um, uh, I play out. Um, in February, I was going to do a little underground party. It was a Parish Studio 69 white party at, at 333 Live. And I had, a gig, I had a time slot like 1 o'clock in the morning. And then I was trying to get into the club. I totally couldn't. I didn't know why. And then you and Nick Thayer walked out. And I, re and I totally missed my set. It was the first time I was going to play like all original set. So my request is, if I throw you this flash drive, maybe throw you might find one throw song it. that you like to play. Yeah. Woo! Got you, bro. I listen to this. No, I man, what I was going to say before is, like, in anything, like, in anything you're trying to start up, businesses, whatever, like, 
if you have a friend, start it with a friend. Like the first guy that should hear your stuff and should be excited about your stuff is the guy that supports you the most anyway. And like maybe you can do it together and then that friend has another friend and you bring them over and you say, hey, check this out. Do you like this? And maybe they don't like it and you find the next person. And literally like it's, it's like you take one brick and just stack the next. And the most you can do yourself, then you can create something. Then sooner or later, people are going to notice what you're doing because you, they can feel that energy. They can feel that like that, I mean, I mean, I think a lot of people, like A&R in the industry, like part of what we look for in an artist is not only someone that makes great music, but it's someone that has that energy, that devotion to what they're doing. And that's, that's a big thing, man. That's what I look for in the artists that I sign are people that are really talented and people that have that energy. Like, I'm just gonna do it. So. Thanks, Sonny. Uh, first off, I wanna say how cool it is to see both of you up there. I'm really big fans of your movement. Cool. Obviously, everybody in this room knows who Skrillex is, but um, a lot of you guys heard today what Jeff does, and as you know, somebody that's partaken and been out to eat, and it's really an incredible thing that they're doing, connecting everybody together. Um, that being said, my question is for Sonny, and I want to say, Sonny, uh, I manage Corella, and I'm always at these events, and you really are, it's amazing how well you treat everybody. You treat everybody the way you want to be treated. I think it's really amazing. And I want to know, um, as a fan of the way you've always sort of dared to be great and take amazing risks. You mentioned with your first tour with the stage production, what advice you would have. I know um, you went really big with the cell and I'm curious as to what advice you could give a manager in making sure that we are able to do something great uh, with the touring experience, but also stay within our means. Yeah, well I think a lot from when I get inspired about what I want to create visually, it always comes from the music first. So my next production, I can't even think about it until the record is, is, is done. So, and I think a lot of what we have and what Cruella has or what all these artists that are coming up in this generation is we have a real strong connection to our culture, to our fans. Like, our fans are the same as us. When you look in the line, they look the same as us. They're our same age. And I think that's the main thing is never forgetting about aesthetically, like, where, where, who you are, who you, who, where you stand in a culture and what, what you stand for. And that's the kind of the punk rock mentality that I've always kept is like, I never want to change who I am. And I only want to grant more importance to the people that look like me, that sound like me, that have the same feelings as me. And, I want to, and that's kind of a commitment as an artist to do. So I think as you grow and start to do more tours and same with your art, just really think about, think about your fans and your culture and all the ideas will come out of that, you know, and, and, and invest in the right way. Invest in, in creating something really beautiful and something that you, because I think people will see that ultimately too. Like, I mean, I don't really do many interviews or talk about it, but, or talk about much, but I, 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 I have a, me and my whole team really pay attention to detail and putting on great experiences because at the end of the day, we're doing it all. So it has to be our vision. If, and, if it's not, then it's just, it's a reflection on me and I'm really hard on myself. So, I mean, that's the kind of same energy I was talking about before, you know? One of, one of the things that we always, one of our maxims is, uh, 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 Michael Hebb, who's a chef out of Seattle, who's credited one of the guys that started the underground food movement, um, he, he gave us great advice. He's like, yo, you know how people say, uh, keep it real? Don't do that. What you have to do is keep it surreal and do things that are a little bit beyond everyone else's imagination. And you and your artist are going to think up what's right for you guys more so than any of us. And if it makes you guys happy and y'all are stoked on it, then there's no chance that we're going to be like, wow, this shit sucks. It's all, about, like, it's all about taking that gut feeling and when it feels so good and the person next to you that's working with you has that same feeling. If you're surrounded by people that don't have your gut, that same gut instinct, then maybe you're not, maybe not to say they're bad people, but maybe they're the wrong fit for you. Like I've always just gravitated towards those people that really get it and they feel the same energy. Because then like, you can feed off that and complete stuff. If you don't have that same energy with the people that you're working with, you never get anything done. Because you're like, man, I should change this or it's not working. And at the end of the day, it's like, you're the art, like, you know, any artist I tell this to and they ask me for advice, like, you know, it's mixed advice. I'm like, man, you know better than me. This is your song. Like, and what's only going to make you grow from being a better artist is if you get over that song and you finish it and you look back and you, whether you hear the criticism or you criticize yourself, that's when you grow and become, and that's when the next song becomes better, you know? If you're that type of artist, I believe. Jeff, sure. Skrillex, thanks so much. Um, you guys are awesome.